Hey everybody, uh, sorry I'm a little sick, but uh, <clears throat> the show must go on and reading must be done. Um, so my voice is a little uh, less than its usual beautiful self, but I think we can all uh, bear with it and have a nice time together. <laughs> Alright, this piece is called Stalinism in East Germany by Hugo Bell. Uh, Hugo Bell uh, was the um, nom de plume, pen name, of uh, a person named Benno Sternberg. Um, this from was originally uh, written and published in <coughs> Socialism au Barbary in 1950 and 1951. Uh, so that's prior to the uh, uh, East German Uprising of 1953. Um, so uh, the reason I am reading this is because I'm trying uh, to get more, uh, get my teeth in deeper into the uh, <coughs> way that the Eastern Bloc and the USSR was uh, received and conceptualized by the critical left. And uh, part of my uh, doing that is focusing on the journal uh, Socialisme au Barbary. I already have a lot of uh, things on the YouTube channel uh, by Cornelius Castoriadis and some by Claude Lafour, who are uh, both part of uh, Socialisme au Barbary after um, breaking from French, uh, from the Fourth International. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of, I think that kind of tells, explains why I'm reading it. Uh, yeah, there's a little introduction here, so we'll start with that. This text, signed by Hugo Bell, Benno Sternberg, illustrates through a concrete historical analysis the theses expounded in the theoretical text presented above. Um, I think he's referring to uh, the piece by uh, Cornelius Castoriadis. Um, maybe not. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's above, but I believe it's a piece by Cornelius Castoriadis on uh, <coughs> the bureaucratic society. This text signed by Hugo Bell illustrates through a concrete historical analysis the theses expounded in the theoretical text presented above. It was later to be included in a book, La classe ouvrière d'Allemagne euh, orientale, I don't fucking know, Essai des chroniques, 1945-1958. The book being published in 1958 by, uh, yeah, a French publisher whose name I don't feel like pronouncing, with the author listed as Beno Sorel, S-A-R-E-L. This work is the fruit of several years of experience in both post-war occupied Germany, supplemented by meticulous documentary work. The author begins by painting a picture of East Germany ravaged by war and subjected by the Russian army to terror first and then to devastating exploitation under the pretext of reparations owed by the German people as a whole to the Soviet Union. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, to my understanding, uh, uh, one of the key features of the post-war uh, <coughs> settlement in uh, Germany, whereas in the West, uh, try to build up the economies of uh, the occupied territories uh, via the Marshall Plan, uh, the Soviet Union sought reparations. So uh, this is, to my understanding, that includes like uh, massive uh, exploitation of the population, but also the uh, stripping of the economy of uh, machinery and other uh, industrial assets. I'm not quite sure about that, but I think that's what happened. In this, quote, hunger zone, 
where the death rate was reaching its heights and where the birth rate was plummeting, the Russians dismantled and brought back home with them machinery, rails, and tire factories, and then, after having noted the waste that accompanied this pillaging, endeavored to relaunch local production, tapping it through, quote, Soviet joint stock companies, end quote. Sovietische Aktien Gesellschaften, or SAGs. At the same time, bracket 1946, end bracket, they pieced together a new communist party, the Socialist Uni Unity Party of Germany, SED, uh, which would be the ruling party in um, uh, East Germany until its collapse in 1989. Um, <clears throat> around a, pure, a core of... Uh, so, yeah, they pieced together a new communist party, the Socialist Unity Party of Germany, around a core of pure Stalinists who had returned from their exile in Russia, while systematically excluding the revolutionaries had, who had remained in Germany. Little by little, through promotions within the working class and by making the most of the extreme dearth of basic necessities in order to create a stratum of relatively privileged persons, a veritable bureaucratic ruling class was constituted that relied obviously on the Soviet occupier and endeavored to assume leadership of society. That did not go without difficulties. We give below two examples of this. The first relates to this Stalinist party state's relation with the bourgeoisie. With this line laid down by the Kremlin ruling out any genuine, quote, socialist revolution, end quote, in East Germany, the bureaucracy in no way sought to expropriate all the capitalists it believed, on the contrary, that it could rely on a certain number among them, the, quote, progressive elements, end quote, of the bourgeoisie to put production back on track while keeping them closely in check. Here is what happened in reality. Okay, so that's the introduction. Um... And here's the actual text. Uh, this is from the uh, Socialism ou Barbarie um, anthology that's available on Libcom. Uh, that was the sound of me shaking up my protein shake because, you know, no matter how much of a cold I have, um, gains must be made. Because I'm a fucking stud. All right, let's go. Everything was organized so that a certain number of capitalists might live and work, though within very strict bounds and under very strict surveillance. The general goal was to profit from the experience of the capitalists in order to run the country's economic machinery with a view toward delivering reparations to the USSR and consolidating the Socialist Unity Party's regime. SED. Yet the Stalinist Party proved politically myopic when it thought that one could, with the help of the state apparatus and propaganda about the, quote, progressive fa fraction of the bourgeoisie, end quote, divert an entire social class from its goal. The bourgeoisie's resistance. As early as 1946, cartels and free capitalist associations were reformed. The small glass manufacturers of Turingia, grouped together and then united with the glass polishers who had emigrated from Bohemia and grouped together on their own. They came to an agreement to push up prices for their production, yet this association as well as other similar ones were sporadic in character for they were quickly discovered. Other capitalist groupings had more luck and grew in scope, thus textile manufacturers and dealers in Saxony had also created a community of clandestine labor back in 1946. Unlike their Turingian colleagues, they were clever enough to occupy the main posts in the textile section of the Industrial Syndicate of Dresden, as well as the latter's subsidiary in Chemnitz. Moreover, and especially, they were able to work their way into the respective department of the Saxon Minister of the Economy. Quite often, these industrialists and big merchants were SED members and took advantage of the theory then in vogue of the progressive current in the bourgeoisie. Thanks to their administrative and political relationships and their cleverness, the weavers and sweater manufacturers of the Chemnitz region made a fortune. They commandeered quantities of raw material and fuel above what they required. They resold these on the black market. They sold a portion of their production secretly to West German or Berlin capitalists or else did offsets in the Russian zone. 
The case of the weavers of Saxony was far from isolated, and other lesser scale scandals broke out in other branches, too. Only a few months after the creation of the syndicates, the capitalists not only succeeded in transforming into their own instruments those bodies the SCD meant to use to control them, but they also, with the help of those bodies, sabotaged planning efforts and broke up the economic administrative apparatus. It thus proved impossible to make the bourgeoisie work against itself, and the theory of the progressive capitalist current collapsed. For in another way, the entire economic situation was favoring capitalism's clever and secret resistance. After the destructions of war, dis the dismantling bracket of factories, etc., and bracket, and the reparations had brought about general shortages. The market was inundated with paper money, and prices were kept artificially at the low level of 1944. Everything was bought and sold. One had to be rather clever to find even poor quality raw materials and amid the ruins some rudiments of means for manufacturing. Many small and middle-sized businesses were thus founded between 1945 and 1947 by former capitalists who had made the most of their commercial experience and their business connections. For the same reason, shortages and general distress, functionaries could be corrupted rather easily. A ministry education editor made 300 to 400 marks a month, and the tiniest manufacturer before the monetary reform juggled many tens of thousands of marks. Again, for the same reason, the capitalists succeeded in influencing or corrupting the works councils, bracket, be, betrib, sureta, in their factories. Those councils agreed that a portion of production would be subtracted from the plan and, quote, compensated for, end quote, that is, swapped through private channels for other commodities or fresh supplies of the workers, excuse me, or fresh supplies for the workers. Often, the works council agreed to cover up the operation if it obtained benefits for itself. Thus, far from, quote, remaining in their place and working, end quote, as the Soviet command would have wanted, the capitalists moved about, wrestled around, and scored points. For the capitalists succeeded in winning over or corrupting the very apparatus that was meant to keep them in check. Of course, in doing this, they felt encouraged by the rebirth of capitalism in West Germany and in general by the superiority of the forces of capitalism over those of the USSR on the world level. profitability of private and nationalized companies. That was only a part of the weight the capitalist sector exerted upon the Russian zone's economy, for often, and especially at the beginning, private companies succeeded, from the standpoint of profitability, in beating the nationalized companies. On March 7, 1940, excuse me, the March 7, 1948 issue of Der Morgen, which is the Liberal Democratic Party's organ in the Soviet zone, demonstrated that for 1947, the nationalized companies of Saxony, which showed a profit of around 5 million marks, had in reality lost 18.5 million, for the financial administration made them a gift of 23.5 million in the form of taxes on capital it did not receive but reportedly claimed from private companies. The non-profitability of the LEBs, bracket, Land as Zygena, Betriba, land owned companies, and bracket, was all the more striking as they enjoyed, in relation to private companies, still other advantages beyond a different taxation. They received subsidies to maintain 1944 prices and were given favorable treatment in the distribution of raw materials. Yet the private sector displayed greater commercial cleverness and the profits brought in by offset deals were incomparably higher than legal profits. The spirit of capitalism spreads to the nationalized sector and public institutions. Simply in order to live and be able to feed their workers, the nationalized companies too had to resort to offsets. Behind the back of party organs and of the regional industrial grouping to which it belonged, the factory sold a portion of its production for its own benefit. 
Often such operations, which were strictly forbidden, were carried out in order to fulfill some tragically pressing need. From time to time, real distress calls from the personnel of nationalized companies made their way even into the SED press, like the one sent by Max Emilian Schittes, worker correspondent to the Stalinist newspaper of Thuringia. Quote, those who are in the administration ought to imagine what it means to fill a blast furnace by flashlight. The men of the blast furnace's night shift are in danger of dying on account of the inadequate lighting caused by the lack of electric light bulbs, end quote. The lot of the manager of a nationalized company was often no more enviable. Excuse me, the lot of the manager of a nationalized company was often no more enviable. The manager of a nationalized company was forced to feed and clothe his workers, for otherwise they were unable to produce. The manager of a nationalized company had to procure raw materials and equipment, for the failure to achieve the plan could mean, for the manager of a nationalized company, dismissal if not arrest. Moreover, the same fate could befall the manager of a nationalized company if his, quote, offsets were too apparent, of course. Growing corruption of the administration's cadre is accompanied, quote, offset deals. The party made desperate efforts to combat such habits. The party strongly condemned, quote, company selfishness and advocated, quote, emulation for democratic reconstruction, end quote. It launched appeal after appeal and threat after threat, instituting a multiplicity of monitoring bodies. Yet its struggle looked like tilting at windmills, for the evil resided in the distress and in the general atmosphere created by the occupation and by Soviet levies on current production. On the other hand, the system of, quote, offsets, the benefits and the easy living these offsets occasioned gradually spread to the upper-level administration and party cadres. For in fact, quote, selfishness was far from limited to companies and extended to the cooperatives to, quote, democratic organizations, end quote, to towns and further along to the governments of the lender. Uh, that's not lender as in, like, English, but uh, it seems like a, 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 a institution. Uh, a, a L A N D E R with, like, the, to, the two dots, which is it's an umlaut. I gotta look that up, actually, because I don't want to sound like a dumbass. Yeah, umlaut. Umlaut. Like motorhead. Um, it was not rare to see cooperatives fighting with the Peasants Mutual Aid Association or the municipality over a factory that had just been appropriated and that would have enlarged each respect, each's respective domain. Other times, one witnessed real cold wars between lender governments. Thus was Saxony Anhalt, for a time, exploited by its neighbors who had coal, textile, raw materials, and chemical products delivered to them while furnishing nothing in exchange. Was that because Saxony Anhalt was the sole land to have a liberal democratic president? Yet among governments led by the SED, the Socialist Unity Party, the dealings were the same. In spring 1947, Thuringia had sent to Saxony thread to be woven. Saxony, however, instead of returning it to Thuringia in the form of fabric, delivered the manufactured product under the heading of reparations and thus saved its own assets from the Russian levies. In exchange, Thuringia later arranged so that its deliveries to Saxony, scheduled as part of the three-month plan, would be deferred until the quarter had elapsed and the deliveries became null and void. During the years of 1946 and 1947, the central administrative offices had no authority over the lender governments in their planning and coordination efforts and true particularism and regional selfishness whose cause was poverty and the lack of future prospects developed in the Russian zone. <coughs> Thus, less than a year after the nationalizations of 1946, the bourgeoisie, 
after having suffered a serious defeat, was on its way to taking its revenge. Far from limiting itself to the sphere assigned to it, it circumvented the constraints to which it was subject, and above all, its spirit and methods won over the opposing camp. The indivi individualism and the quest for profits overrode the collectivist feelings one was trying to imprint. Once again, it proved to be the case that individualism is naturally born of poverty and that poverty ill lends itself to planning. The Stalinist party, which thought that it could master social reality through edicts and police tactics, saw the failure at the very least, the partial failure of its policy and particularly of its attempt to, quote, utilize the bourgeoisie. True, an SED card had become the key to every social position, but the Stalinist party's policy contained a fundamental contradiction that condemned it to Sisyphean tasks. It created collectivist-type bodies under its domination like the LEBs, and supported them with all its energies, but at the same time it remitted 100% of the Russian levies, and thus helped to generate the accompanying poverty, quote, company selfishness, quote, local selfishness, and in general, bourgeois-type individualism. Between spring 1947 and spring 1948, the party went to great lengths to surmount this contradiction, but what would again be through administration... Excuse me, what would again be through administrative measures and police excuse me, but that would again be through administrative measures and police tactics. Um there's a uh, brackets that says dot 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 and bracket and it's back to italics, which means that this is a comment from the editor. Hugo Bell's study particularly well highlights the process by which the instauration of the Communist Party dictatorship radically transformed its relations with the working class and it revealed its nature as an exploitative class. It was not rare in the aftermath of the Reich's collapse for the workers to mobilize themselves spontaneously in order to restart their factories. The party promptly put things to rights. Under the authority of a reliable hierarchy, it sought to reinstate industrial discipline everywhere. Yet it was difficult to motivate workers to work by letting them die of hunger and by levying the better part of their production in order to send it to Russia. Also, the party sought to rely on the works councils, Betrieb's Reta, the Allied Control Council, had set up bracket, as a possibility end bracket, in April 1946. Um. Yeah, just so you know, sometimes you'll see that in um, uh, German uh, other discussions of the radical uh, left, um, uh, workers' councils, um, council is a uh, reta. Uh, I don't know why I'm saying that, but just uh, more of a, me talking to myself. Once again, the Stalinist party tended to imprison social reality within a fiction that was made up from start to finish. The workers, this is this is a uh, Hugo Bell again. Sorry. Once again, the Stalinist party tended to imprison social reality within a fiction that was made up from start to finish. The workers grudgingly produced goods that were going away to the USSR. Were they hostile to a party that remitted these levies? One would endeavor to convince them through propaganda that everything was all right. At the same time, all opposing opinions were stifled. Through a sleight of hand, one got the workers to elect Stalinist representatives in the works councils. These councils would then conduct the party's policy while claiming to represent the workers. In accordance with their principles of confidence in the apparatus and the cadres and with their habit of holding the masses in contempt, the Stalinist leaders were ready to think that, quote, by holding, end quote, the representatives of the workers, they would be able to influence and, quote, hold, end quote, the workers as well. Reality would soon show how inflexible it was to the party's maneuvers. Um, 
Um, yeah, it's important to say that they, these councils aren't like workers' councils proper. Um, these are works' councils. The works' councils split along the line of the Stalinist party slash working masses divide. Elections for the works' councils unfolded predictably. Made skeptical about everything, the workers approved generally without discussion the candidate list that had been offered them by the trade union factory committer, committee after having been drawn up by the Stalinist cell bosses with the approval of local party leaders. Once elected, the Betriebsreta had to apply the production program on which they had run. Quite quickly, it was noticed that most of the factory cells had been obliged to take on some undependable elements in order to complete the list. Too disconnected from the mass, they did not really have enough cadres to control the council. Many people who had run were in reality apolitical, though formerly members of the SED, or else old communists who felt closer to the workers than the bureaucratic directors. <laughs> Only in a few cases did the Betriebs rot try to apply the, quote, work first, end quote, policy the party was applying, particularly in the VEBs, which are, um, this is in brackets, Folks Eigene Betriebe, publicly or people's owned companies, end bracket, and the SAGs. But when the Betriebsrat was transformed Almost automatically into an auxiliary of the cell and even of the police, the workers paid no attention to the Betriebsrat harangues about production. So the Betriebsrat was obliged to introduce peace rates, reinforce labor discipline, and sometimes frisk workers at the factory gates to discover, quote, saboteurs and thieves, end quote. Of course, in that case, the Betriebsrat no longer had anything in common with the workers, the Betriebs Rot had failed in its mission to link workers with the nascent bureaucratic stratum and had placed itself deliberately into the latter camp of the bureau nascent bureaucratic stratum. Most often, the Betriebs Rot was composed of workers who remained close to the concerns of their working comrades. That was rather clearly apparent in the month of November 1946 when the Betriebs Rata, excuse me, the Betriebs Reta, issued their first quarterly report. Most complained of the bad food for the workers and declared that under such conditions, production could not be increased. There were instances where the Betriebsrat warded off resolutions formulating such a demand that had been adopted by the Trade Union Committee or the Socialist Unity Party's cell. The result was that thenceforth, thenceforth, much less publicity was given to quarterly balance sheets and that later on those balance sheets were practically no longer drawn up. In late 1946, the trade unions undertook an investigation into 100 nationalized companies, Betriebsreta. Only 16 had calculated the cost price of production and had raised the issue of balancing the company's budget. The council's concern lay elsewhere, procuring food for the personnel to eat. But that was possible only illegally or through personal relationships, and the council then inevitably entered into conflict with the party, and sometimes the factory's Stalinist cell and management. It would sometimes happen that the Betriebsrat would grant the workers two days leave per week, just so that they could go to the countryside to load up on food and management would just cancel the measure. <laughs> Most often, the Betriebs rot sold on the black market or, quote, offset, end quote, a portion of its production against provisions. It would sometimes happen that the cell would then threaten to arrest the Betriebs rot. Often a genuine enmity arose between those two bodies. The fact was acknowledged by the Berlin SED's internal bulletin, Villa und Weg of February 1947. One year after their official creation, the nationalized companies, the Triebsreta, had certainly escaped party control. Not only had they not succeeded in sealing the break that existed between workers and bureaucrats, 
but the works councils had themselves divided along the lines of this very break between workers and bureaucrats. <clears throat> the Betrebes rot, Stalinist cell, and company management. Speaking schematically, one can state that within a nationalized company, the Betrebes rot represented the workers, the Stalinist cell represented the interest of the Kremlin, established order, and the general interest of the nascent caste, while management was most often beset by, quote, company selfishness, end quote. The trade union committee generally found itself under the influence of the cell. The workers' hostility to the bureaucrats rarely expressed itself through highly developed forms of struggle. There were in all, were in all only three or four strikes for better nourishment, which were quickly repressed. The Betrebes rot represented not only the workers, but also their dead-end situation, their lack of future prospects, and their lack of hope in the destiny of their class. At no moment was there a serious attempt to unite the working class against the bureaucracy. The working class remained dispersed and simply endeavored to stay alive. Within each factory, however, the workers sometimes succeeded in influencing not only the Betriebsrat, but as we have seen, the cell and management as well. All three got along in order to cover unofficial business. Great was the party's dismay in such cases. This feeling was expressed, for example, in the September 1947 issue of the trade union's theoretical review, Arbeit, which wrote, quote, The Betriebs Retta and the company's trade union or political groups tend to find themselves under pressure and be pulled along by unpoliticized and discontented portions of the personnel, end quote. <laughs> Yet most often the party did not publicize such feelings and sometimes its dismay was expressed through arrests. There also were tense situations between management and cell. Management's members belonged to the cell yet did not generally come to meetings. Grappling with tremendous problems, they ran up against the requirements of the party, represented here by the secretary of the SED group. Not being able to oppose it overtly, they feigned ignorance of the cell. Yet in their attitude, a tinge of contempt was not lacking as an accompaniment for their hostility. The current managers, former revolutionary workers, had made a new step toward the acquisition of caste, condi excuse me, of caste, C -A -S -T -E, consciousness. Caught up in their managerial preoccupations, they felt themselves superior not only to the mass of laborers, but also to their old party comrades who remained workers, continuing to live as before, day to day, engrossed by the problems of their existence. Often there was a personal connection between company management and the cell's leadership. The cor this corresponded to the lack of mid-level party cadres, the consequence of which almost always was to subordinate the cell to management. The party then reacted, handing back real management to reliable elements, even at the risk of letting production collapse, but the situation always remained quite unsteady. The Stalinist party had therefore far from mastered the domestic situation of the, quote, people's own companies, end quote. There were, on the one hand, workers who were dispersed, hostile, and resorted to individual solutions, on the other, the bureaucratic directional group united by a concern for production for which it was solely in charge, but torn between the need not to distance itself from the workers and the need to follow the party line. The old individualistic spirit of capitalism was also represented by the bureaucratic group's need to have recourse to offsets. The corruption and the desire for enrichment were not lacking either and extended even to the members of the Works Council. Bracket, dot, 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 and bracket. Meaning that there's, uh, we're cutting some things out of this piece, uh, this translation. Um, I would probably read the extended full thing, but I don't I doubt that the full thing is in English. Um, um.
The Stalinist Party's Reaction The Stalinist attempt to revive, with the Betrieb's Reta's aid, both the illusion of the workers' vanguard and the zeal for work from the summer of 1945 had failed. Despite its political amorphousness, the working class had established how the majority of councils would behave. Faced with its weight and its desire to live, the network of Stalinist cadres proved too feeble. The Socialist Unity Party was increasingly considered an organization of Kislings, and labor productivity, which was in early 1947, according to official sources, 40% of what it was in 1936, was not an upward curve. The Betrieb's Reta constituted, at the very least in form, a democratic means for resolving the problem of labor productivity. Thenceforth, the party would resort to ever more purely bureaucratic and forceful means. The party gradually was going to restrict the rights of the Betrieb's Reta until it dissolved them. It was going to introduce into the factory the exploitative methods known in the USSR under the name Stakhanovism. Finally, it was going to create out of thin air police state supervisory bodies, which it would name popular, and which it was then going to, rep going to present as stemming from laboring people's own initiatives. Each measure was going to, be represent going to be presented as a democratic victory, but its propaganda no longer found any echo among the workers. And increasingly, this propaganda was to become a simple political excuse for communist-turned-bureaucrats. Combined with the, con the attraction of material advantages, the teaching of Stalinism in schools was to become the way to recruit new political leadership cadres and economic managers. Bracket, dot, dot, dot. In bracket. So that was an abridged article, and but I think we uh, I got a lot out of it. So uh, thanks for listening, and uh, yeah. Uh, that was uh, Stalinism in East Germany by uh, Hugo Bell or Benno Sternberg from 1950 and 1951. Thanks for listening.